Okay. So we, are, we are recording. All right, let me do the screen share. Here we go. Hang on, I've got to go advanced portion of screen and share. Oops, not that. There we go. I can see it. Is Great. it okay for other people? All right. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you great. Just a quick reminder to everybody to mute yourselves if you can, because um, otherwise it will distract from, from, from James's talk because you will pop on screen. <clears throat> okay. okay. Um, well, thanks for the intro. And um, just I wanted to say also by way of housekeeping, uh, this is a topic that I find people tend to have a lot of questions. So that's why I was trying to start kind of close to on time. And um, let's make a goal of approximately 45 minutes from now. We'll see if people have questions, but I will really mostly try to finish a bit early so that people can have questions at the end. Um, the chat box is there. I probably can't read it exactly when I'm talking, but if you have something that pops into your head, you could just write something like, you know, Q, with a topic or something and um i i try my hardest not to be jargony but i will occasionally slip out with jargon so if i say a perfume term or, or something that doesn't make sense um probably Mineta or saskia might be able to answer it on the chat I'm, i've tried to vet this not to be too uh much using astrological lingo but we'll just see okay so um and I lost your head, uh, Saskia. Is that okay? Uh, but just let me know if there's something not working on I'm the I'm so sorry. I don't know what's going on. It might be my system. But um, okay. uh, maybe. Yeah, just let me know. Can you see I'm Mineta? I can't hear. Are you able to I see Mineta? I can see you. I haven't, I haven't tried to see the other participants. I can okay. see you. Just give me like a little shout out on the chat or something if something's not working. No problem. So, okay. Well, with no further ado, we'll go into this. So. This is a completely crazy thing because it's like <laughs> 10 hours of material, which I've decided to kind of hone down to try to do in like an hour and 20 minutes. Um, and uh, one of the ways of doing that is focusing on the seven planets as sort of cornerstones of astrology and Western astrology. So before I even start this, I've said this as a preamble before with other talks. There, there's no reason why you would need to actually believe that astrology had some sort of actual validity. You can really see it as a symbol system. It is a system which intersects with perfume for thousands of years. Um, and I think just using it that way is extremely helpful as a way of approaching it. Also, I'm going to give you something that will give you a different perspective. Uh, a lot of people have this issue where it's kind of like, well, it doesn't make sense that this gassy rock that's millions of miles in space is going to affect me. So I would rather redefine astrology as the art of time. It's really looking at t cycles of time, how do specific times imprint themselves on things and have unique characteristics. And so um, we will be focusing on that. I will be giving you some historical stuff, but not too much, not to bog you down, but just to give you enough. I mean, just before we start, the quickie, like three minute overview, is um, this is primarily Western astrology. I will talk a bit about Indian astrology and some aspects of Arabic astrology, which are slightly different. Um, also, uh, pretty much it, what the focus is gonna be it is um, just purely like more perfume things and um, plants and herbs and that kind of thing. So the quickie overview is this. Approximately 4,000 years ago in Mesopotamia, otherwise known as Babylon. Babylon was the, the primary city there. It's in pretty much where modern day Iraq is now, not far from Baghdad, is where a, a lot of our astrology started from. Um, basically, it started with uh, omens in the sky where people observed them and kept notations over the course of hundreds of years. And it eventually evolved into something where people we're looking at what they would consider wandering stars, which are the planets, and they associated these stars, the seven planets that are visible to naked eye, they associated them with various gods and goddesses. And this is something that continues to this day. Um, basically, 
this got developed and in uh, late Egypt in the time of the Ptolemies, primarily in Alexandria and Greco-Roman Egypt, it was really developed into what we, we think of as Hellenistic astrology, which is the basic, of, basic part that becomes Western astrology. Uh, it, was, it was written up by a number of uh, famous astrologers. I may be mentioning some of them, like Vidius Valens, who was in the second century. And then what happened after that is that around maybe the third century, it went to India, where it developed in its own way. It continued to be developed in Rome. Um, then it went to uh, the Byzantine Empire, Constantinople, which is now Istanbul. During the Middle Ages, it was continued to be practiced, though it was vastly more emphasized in the Islamic Golden Age in um, Arabic translations. And it went from there into the Renaissance. It had kind of a lag period in the late 1700s, 1800s, which I'll talk to about before there was a revival. So let us go to the next slide. Okay, so um, to the left, is a screenshot of my iPhone. So <laughs> what this illustrates is that recently, if you're like me, pretty much I wake up and I, I think to myself, I have no idea, what, what day is it? I, I, like, you know, what day of the week is this? So this is me picking up my phone and it says sun, May 3. So obviously sun is, it is short for Sunday, but literally, the days of the planets which are assigned to the weeks are right in front of our face, like all the time. They literally appear everywhere, but we just don't really see them because it's not something we're thinking of. They're codified into our time system, this arbitrary, strange seven-day week, which we've had, as I'll explain, for thousands of years. Um, so I think it's important for us to realize that there are, there are parts of astrology that have just seeped into our culture, and sometimes we really forget about it. So the first thing here on the top and let me just move some things so i can read it a little bit better okay so i'm i'm asking this question which is very much like an experimental scent kind of question what does time smell like it's an abstract question i think we can talk about how we have nostalgia for times past and how certain eras may be might be associated with time and and historically Astrology is very associated with certain times of the year, with times that you would plant things, with harvest and things like that. But it, time, in this case, also focuses on the two main lights in the sky, which are the sun and the moon. The sun obviously organizes our day. It, there's a system that comes from Egypt where it divides things into 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of darkness. But I think I would like people to start, and this is obviously Institute for Art and Olfaction, so I'm gonna be pushing people to do some things that are more like the art of perfume. How would a person qualify specific times of the day? I think midnight is easy, like if you think like a perfume that's, that, that signifies midnight, people would come up with things like a femme fatale, something dark and mysterious. Uh, coming up with something that smells like high noon, I mean, that would really depend on the person, I, but it would be definitely something else. And so I think it's important for people to start with thinking like, how do certain time periods uh, reflect themselves in fragrances? So our week is planetary. I'll explain this in a minute. Um, but basically the days of the week are named after planets. It goes back to ancient Babylon. That's where it was started. What happened is that they had a seven day week and the days of the week were linked to their planets and gods. And this persisted, it became picked up in the classical Jewish calendar, uh, you know, a long time ago, like more than 2,500 years ago. And eventually it became codified in Rome in something called the Julian calendar, which was, I think it's like 45 BC or something like that. The reason it's important is because there have been a lot of calendar changes since then, but the actual seven day week has not changed since then. It's been this continuous cycle of Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, et cetera, going on for thousands of years. It's one of the few things that's been maintained. It's kind of fascinating. And it's entered our language by having different uh, descriptors for things. Clearly people know the sun is your sunny, Less known things are like the day of Mars, which is Tuesday. People talk of martial things having to do with war. 
jovial has to do with Jupiter, which is Thursday. And there are other kinds of astrological ideas, which are like temperaments that have seeped into our language. Seasons and monthly cycles, I think, are a little easier for people to relate to fragrances. For instance, people you know, frequently say that there are certain fragrances that are summer smells or fragrances and certain things that are associated with winter. The monthly cycles are a little different. I'll have people think about that. And key to what we're talking about is that the different times of the day, the times of the month, the planets all had correspondences with all kinds of things. They had correspondences with gods and later on with like angels, with different kinds of precious stones, with plants, including fragrant plants, with animals. There was a whole list of correspondences. And in the next slide, I'll show you something from the 17th century, what's called the magical calendar. Um, it's in the next slide. And this is, oh God, it's a little blurry, but so the British Museum has one of these. Of course, the Getty has one. It's part of this alchemy collection they got from Manly Palmer Hall. This is this huge, huge thing. It's like a gigantic scroll where like the days of the week match with all these different like plants and animals and things. And then and they match with angels and these incredible diagrams. And this is part of this whole science of correspondences. Okay, next. All right, so I am gonna go over some of the structure of how people decided what was assigned to what, but I wanna start off by just throwing us into it, even if some of this is hard for people to grasp, and then we'll come back to it. But uh, let's just start with the moon. It's almost full moon, so I was going to start with this and kind of talk about what some of the, the associations were with the moon and how those may be associated with fragrance. And we will kind of deconstruct this as we go on. So the moon, the sun and the moon are not planets, but they were called planets. Um, or often they were called lights or luminaries. And they were the most important of the seven, obviously because they are the ones that dictate our time system, the ones that are big that you can't you know, not pay attention to. And they're extremely light. They were considered the two lights. They have this kind of yin yang where the sun was like the king and the moon was the queen. The moon obviously rules the night. We already talked about the night. So she is associated with things, as I'll say in a minute, things that bloom at night, but just things that seem nocturnal to people. She's associated with the sea. So immediately you can associate all kinds of things with this. For instance, uh, in natural perfumery, people will, will use um, seaweed absolute or something like that that has a marine smell. There are lots of different uh, aroma chemicals that have a salty smell. I know probably about 15 years ago in fragrances, mostly in artisan fragrances, and then in kind of niche fragrances, people started putting out a lot of salty kind of fragrances. It became very much of a trend. Um, so salt is definitely a note that people use. Next, the moon is thought to be cool and moist. Those are essential qualities that it has. So as far as things that are moist and cool that have been traditionally associated with the moon, cucumbers, because cool as a cucumber, right? Those things are moist and they're cool. And in fact, they're considered to be ruled by the moon. Melons also are essentially considered lunar. Both of these, there are various cucumber and melon aldehydes that are used in fragrances. And these are often notes that you'll find that would be considered lunar. Next, the moon is cool. So things that are easy for people to relate to, obviously camphor, you know, it's something that people will smell, oftentimes in liniments and so on. It's not used quite that much in fine fragrance. There can be little touches of it. Wintergreen is a familiar thing to people, mostly from uh, candies and things like that. They both have a sensation of intense coolness, which links them with the moon. So getting into more abstract stuff, um, anything that's white, and I'll talk about this in a minute, how people code colors to fragrances, but things that are literally white, including white flowers, do get rolled by the moon. So classically, pretty much any white flower could be considered a lunar flower in a lot of systems. Things that bloom at night especially would be so. And I'm giving examples of night blooming jasmine. That would be like a jasmine sandback um, or tuberose, for instance, which blooms at night. Those are considered um, things that are essentially lunar. The next one is 
unusual. I do not know of anyone <laughs> except for me who has decided this is a lunar thing, but I'm just putting it out there. So in classic astrology, the moon is considered a great mother and she rules over milk. Milk also happens to be white and it's watery, so it's considered one of her substances, but milk is essentially lunar. So there are milky notes and fragrance. They're generally considered lactones. That's a technical term for them. Um, they have milky, creamy facets to them. Things that people can easily relate to are coconut, for instance, has this. And there are things in peach and apricot skin, which are very milky. There is an aroma compound um, that I've mentioned here, gamma dodecalactone. This is something that is uh, a aroma compound. There is a natural isolate that is available. I think it's from apricot skin. And in fact, Mandy sells it at her store because she uses it in some of her fragrances. So these are milky notes. So to me, these code very lunar. Getting more abstract, a precious stone of the moon would be pearls. Obviously, pearls are white and they're round. Like, it's just kind of obvious why they were considered to be little tiny representations of the moon. But I do think that people, in a minute, will describe this. People can sense that certain fragrances seem soft and also pale. And I use the word nacreous, which is like another word for like a mother of pearl sensation. There are some fragrances that have this weird iridescent or pearlescent quality to them that I think people describe subjectively. Uh, animals are things that are nocturnal. So I think I mentioned in my intro that I wrote up like an owl would be considered something with the moon because the owl flies at night um, and anything in the water. So we'll get to this later. I'm gonna talk about the uh, various planets and animals because there are fragrances based on animals and it's kind of an interesting concept. Okay, so this kind of gives us a preview. So next slidey. Okay, so now we're in Paris in 1914. So, um, sorry James, is James talk available to download? Oh, um, well someone has a question, we'll answer that shortly. Um, eventually this will be recorded but I don't know when it will be available. He'll tell us. It's gonna be a couple weeks, probably. Yeah, okay. Are people hearing this? Is this okay? Okay. So I'll be able to answer this later, hopefully. Um, so this is Paris, 1914. This is from a periodical called La Vie Mysterieuse, um, which is a, basically a spiritualist publication from 1914. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how astrology fragrances occurred more like in the 20th century and contemporary fragrances. Uh, this, as you can see it, it has this fantastic logo at the top on the left. There's this woman who's doing a card reading and there's an astrologer. And then towards the right, there's like a seance and someone's being mesmerized. Um, and there's all these things on here. Cardomancy, which is card reading, um, occultism, magic, magnetism, astrology. Um, so next slide. So this is an advertisement from here where it basically advertises that they have astrolog parfum astrologique. And this is according to the formula of, the, of a Madame de Luçon. Um, and she's the official astrologer for the magazine V Mysterieuse. So these are basically the distillation of uh, fleur astral, which would be like, you know, uh, star flowers. Um, and I'm really sorry, I don't know exactly what's in here. I tried to figure it out and investigate it. It appears that they offered seven perfumes, one for each of the planets. Um, but this is just an example of something that would be occurring in 1914 in Paris. If you're a perfume history buff, I don't know if anyone is, certainly this is a huge time for perfume in Paris. And um, people probably had um, a, available to them a lot of really high quality perfume products and someone decided to make these astrological perfumes which they sold in this kind of mysterious journal which was for people who were into occult things. And Paris was quite the hotbed of all things kind of mystical and occult at that time. Um, and as I'll say, this goes back like 2000 years but this is an example of something from 1914. Certainly Paris continued to 
be a place where astrology intersected with the arts. Um, just to throw out some stuff, like I was just re recently reading um, uh, Diaries of Agnes Nin from the 1930s. One of her best friends was the Swiss astrologer Henri Morricone, and she introduced him to Henry Miller, which is how he named a lot of his books, like Tropic of Cancer and Tropic of Capricorn. And all, all these surrealists and people um, were artists at the time in the Demi Monde were really interested in astrology. It was inspiring for them in their art and in their writing. Uh, so it, it did have an impact on a lot of people. Okay, so now we're gonna move uh, fast forward to contemporary times, to 20, oh, almost contemporary. So here we are in the 60s. Okay, so on the left, we have like a drugstore solid perfume called My Sign by Tussie. My sign is Virgo and it is a spring bouquet, which makes no sense because Virgo's in the fall, but that's okay, Tussie, we'll just let it go. Um, so this is an example of a burgeoning of interest. And this occurred during what people refer to now as the psychedelic era, which is generously the late 60s through the early 70s. This is a time of hippies and psychedelic exploration which led to this incredible interest in astrology. Two things that I mention as signal events, the musical Hair, which had the song Age of Aquarius, was massively popular. Um, and then there was a book, I believe it was in 68, that Linda Goodman's Sun Signs hit the bestseller list of the New York Times. It's like never ever has an astrology book been on the bestseller list of the New York Times. I don't think anything happened after that, maybe. But this became gigantically popular. Astrology at this time focused almost exclusively on personality traits, where basically it was kind of an entertaining thing, but it was more or less like, you know, what kind of traits does a person of a certain sun sign have? Um, what's their personality? So, not surprisingly, this is really the approach that most people have used for astrology when people have astrology guides to fragrances. Like I noticed that Lucky Scent has an astrology guide to fragrances and such, and it's all based on personality. So an example of that would be, oh, you're an Aries. Aries is really badass. You need a badass perfume that's bold. You know, that would be Aries. Or, oh, you're a Pisces. Pisces are very sensitive and dreamy. You need a dreamy, mystical perfume. So this is kind of a personality trait equals an astrology perfume. I don't, I'm not like against this, but it's a little uh, kind of a bit one dimensional. And I really think there's a lot more interesting things involved that people can get into. So one of the reasons this happened is because classical astrology kind of pooped out, not to go into great details, but it really died out like around, you know, the 17th and 18th century. It, it's, it was maintained as kind of a peasant thing for planting and stuff. In the late 18th century with the spiritualism and all these other kinds of phenomena, as I, you know, noted in that um, magazine from Paris, people became interested in astrology, but it tended to be very psychological because they were trying to make it modern. They're like, we want to make it modern for the modern age. And they focused a lot on psychology. And then later, like in the 20s, it was huge. And in the 30s is when they had newspaper columns and it was more of a pop thing. So um, a, a lot of the ancient traditions were kind of lost. And to be honest, um, you know, they have been revived, but I don't know that a lot of people are familiar with them as far as how they relate to perfume. So, but there are people currently in 2020 who do know. And so the next slide is... Okay, so Janine is here in the audience. Hello, Janine. My friend Janine is here. So this is from um, Black Earth Botanica. Uh, you can find her on Instagram. So she does what I would call bespoke or she would call custom perfumes. These are for an individual person based on their natal chart, the birth chart, which is the chart for the time you're born, which gives you your sun sign moon sign, the other planets, and the sign that's rising on the horizon when you're born. And then based on her analysis of the chart, she will come up, hi James, so she will come up with a um, individual fragrance. So this is an example of people, of someone who's not just doing a personality thing, she's really going to do it a little more deeply because she's more deeply interested in astrology and, and she does things, that it's artisanal, she does it on her own. And um, she also has some other lines that are more focused on planets. And she also does some other esoteric stuff with runes and stuff, which is very unusual. So that's one example of someone from 2020. Uh, the next person 
is Caitlin. So Caitlin has Sphere and Sundry. This is a, a screenshot from Instagram. She is extremely traditional. Um, she is an astrologer and she does things that are current and up to date, but they use a lot of ancient traditions. She focuses a lot on what are called magical elections. An election is a special thing where you, you pick the perfect time for something to happen. The most common thing that people are familiar with, I think, are astrologers picking the time of a wedding. This is really common in Indian astrology. Um, but it, it is a specific ancient technique where you look at the time that's the best time for a specific planet. She does these with different planets. She'll, she'll do an election and pick the perfect time or a very good time. And then sometimes she'll actually harvest like roses or whatever at the time and distill them and or she'll make it so that it's actually born at that moment and has the quality of that moment. It is combined with what I call ritual actions. She could be doing prayers, the planets and some other sorts of things. In traditional astrology, besides the fragrances, she may include things as, as you know, minerals and stones. Sometimes it has animal and other ingredients. The colors would match this in case, in this case, Mars is the angry red planet. It's red. She has this magic square of Mars and you can't see it, but there's like a little uh, sigil of one of the planets, uh, planetary spirits down there. Um, and so I call these talismanic and remedial. So remedial means that these can be used as remedies. So you can think of Mars as a medicine. If you don't have enough Mars, you may be kind of, uh, kind of lackadaisical and weak, and you might need this fiery Mars, like a personal coach to kick your butt and to get you going. I'll talk about this a little bit. It's also talismanic. Some people have Mars as a important planet in their chart and they want to strengthen it. So they might be using some of this um, specific fragrance. So she's someone who does these very traditional things. Of course, they're updated for 2020, but this is a current person who's doing astrology based perfumes. Okay, next. Okay, so this is our friend, um, Septimus Peace. I believe one of the wards is named after him. Is that not correct? Yes. Um, so this was a system, so this is perfume classification, which is this insane, crazy topic, but I will try to make it simple. So over the years, people had different ways of organizing things. This person came up with the idea that he would match perfumes with music. This is something which is st stuck with us to a certain degree because we talk about notes and perfumery. We talk about bass notes and top notes. And we talk about something called accords that are basically like chords in music. And what's interesting is this is a seven-fold scale because there are uh, the seven notes. Uh, notice this is a bit of a coincidence because there's also seven days in the week. It's totally not a coincidence because there's this whole mystical thing. There's seven colors, there's seven days of the week, there's seven planets. There's this very kind of mystical thing with the number seven. Um, and he had the system, which is interesting. Um, the, one of the things which I'm going to bring up is that it involves what we would think of as a linking between hearing and smell. It's not technically a synesthesia, and I'll talk about synesthesia in a minute, but it is a way where you link this, the, the sense of smell with the sense of hearing, which I think is interesting. Nowadays, there's all these classification schemes. There's things that brown for more than 100 years where they have perfume families, like it's a floral or it's a woody fragrance, and there's these perfume wheels and so on. But this is interesting because the seven-fold classification um, is also mirrored in what I'm going to talk about uh, with planets. Now, just to give an example of something that's older, to give people some perspective, a non-European uh, perspective. So this is just something I happen to be familiar with. So in West Africa, there are Yoruban traditions where there are plant experts, people who work with leaves and plants and herbs, and they classify them based on a lot of different sensory qualities. Like for instance, the plant may have a lot of sap in it, it may be very dry, it could have a lot of thorns, it could have a lot of other qualities, including the fragrance uh, is, is very, very important. And they classify things by deity. Like if, if a certain thing has a specific quality, it belongs to that deity. In this case, um, the deities are called Orisha, 
And this is sort of living tradition, which persists in currently in uh, African diasporic traditions, most notably in uh, Lakumi, or, oh, someone is born in West Africa, that's cool. And most notably in Lakumi or Santeria, and these orishas embody certain types of natural forces. So here's an example, the very old classification system where a plant would belong to a god. I, just as a quick example, um, Yemaya, who's a, um, a goddess who's associated with water um, and is, is uh, you know, a very popular um, orisha, is um, associated with melons. She likes melons, which is interesting. It's kind of lunar, you know, they're moist, they're cool. Um, but this is an example of how people classified things um, previously before the Western traditions. And in some ways, this way of classification is similar to the astrological thing. So the last thing I have here is naming is classification. So this is like incredibly key. Giving things a name solidifies them. We'll talk a little bit about this. It basically gives them like a certain character. Okay, next. Okay. So I'm just a little shout out to something's coming in the eighth. This is John's um, talk uh, about writing about smell. So this is, this is about writing and I, this is a great class, but to me, this is also really a talk about what I call sensory training. So part of learning to smell is being able to link the sense of smell with other senses. He, I believe calls it sensory linking. So um, we do this automatically, but I think you have to practice it. And when you write it down, it makes it more concrete and it makes you better at it. So synesthesia, not to go too far, is but basically it describes when people are able to have two senses that blend together. It's usually considered an involuntary thing. It's supposed to be very rare. Um, and so, for instance, you know, someone could say waffle and they'd have a taste of like, you know, like bubble gum or something. Um, but there are ways that this can be induced by substances, like when people are on hallucinogens and stuff where they have their senses blended together. And I think it's actually something that everyone can do that can be learned, though this hasn't really been researched. The reason why it's important, because again, when you do stuff in astrology, it's helpful to have various senses that you associate with things. For instance, I think a lot of times people describe things as plush, like a certain fragrance almost feels like you're putting your fingers in a cat's fur, or it could be spiky. Some things feel spiky. Some woods feel raspy. Um, there are sounds associated with things, such as bass notes, feel kind of deep. Um, clearly, temperatures would describe cool things. And there's some movement associated with, with certain types of fragrances as well. And learning how to connect the senses is really a key if you're going to connect a fragrance with like a place or an object or an animal or certain types of people. Okay, next. Okay, so now we're into the seven planets. I'm going to breeze through some of this. I don't want to like torture you. But um, so there are these seven planets. This is something that's a system that's been around for thousands of years and codified to our seven day week for quite a while. Um, as I mentioned here. Now at the bottom, the way that this is organized here is according to if you're on the earth, what subjectively seems to be close and also what rotates fastest. The moon takes like 29 and a half days to go around, the Mercury takes a little bit longer, the sun takes a year, the Mars takes a couple years, and Saturn takes a full like 28 and a half years to make a complete cycle. So there's a lot of symbology from fast to slow the moon being the closest and the fastest. So, uh, next. Okay, so ignore some of these things in the middle, but the smells were so, I mean, it seems to be the planets were associated with ages, which to me codifies a smell. Now the moon as the closest was maternal. It's associated with uh, babies essentially. So they have this thing called the seven ages of man, um, and they associated the moon with newborns. And there are a tremendous number of associations we have, mostly with products that they use on little kids, which would be something like baby powder. Um, and um, at the extreme in Saturn is the other extreme, which is, it's very old. And so people also associate that not only with old people, but old things like antiques. Um, and so 
this is the planet Saturn rules, things like that. And there's certainly fragrances, I think, that read as something like kind of a, you know, it smells like, oh, I'm in a museum. It's like an old book, that kind of thing. Venus, which we'll talk about more, comes in post-pubescence. Um, Venus is the goddess of love. And interestingly, not surprisingly, she shows up at this age where people are in this idealized youth and beauty. And this is the kind of fragrances that are associated with her or this particular age group. So right away, you don't really need to know that much about astrology. If you just see this order, I mean, it can tell you a lot about, you know, codes and, and certain types of associations with planets and smells. Okay, next. Okay, well, I'll skip over this. So there are all these ideas where this leached into all kinds of occult things. Here you can see where it mentions that these ancient planets like Ishtar was Venus, Nargal was Mars, and, um, you can see a menorah here. Um, it is actually true that some of these ideas got absorbed into um, mystical um, traditions in Judaism, particularly the Kabbalah. There's a lot of astrology associated with certain parts of the tree of life. Um, but the seven, again, is, is, is very key. So next. Okay, and here's the seven days of a week. We'll go over this kind of fast. But so Sunday is Dimash, it's sun. Monday is Lundi in French, the moon. Tuesday is Mars, Mardi. Wednesday is Mercury, and um, that's Mercury. Thursday is Jove's day, that's uh, the Jupiter. Friday is Vendredi, which is Venus, and Saturday is Saturn. And then quickly, the next thing, just so we can remember it, the, oh, sorry, this is not kind of blurry, but these were the uh, kind of Norse Germanic gods that gave us his names. Like for instance, Wednesday is Woden's day and Friday is like Freya's day. Okay, next. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a couple things that discuss fragrances. I just is not exhaustive because I wanna kind of get into it, but just to give you an idea. so. There is a group of papyri called the um, Greco-Roman Magical Papyri, which exists in a number of museums. They have, um, the date of them is a little questionable. Um, this particular one is called the Leiden Papyrus. It's, they list it as the third century, but they think it's probably earlier. Why it's important is because it had this little formula thing where it gave um, instances for the different planets. It's, it's, a bit problematic because some of the botanical names are not easily translatable. But I'm going to give you an example here. Sun shows up as frankincense. It does seem to be clearly frankincense that we're familiar with. Frankincense has always been burned for solar gods. And of course, then it got transferred to being burned on Sunday in the church. Um, and it, it continues to persist as something that's associated with the sun. For the moon, they gave myrrh. This is an example of why it's complicated. So in antiquity, when they said myrrh, they did not necessarily mean the myrrh that we use a lot in fragrance, um, but they often meant a poppinax, which is another time of camophora. And you can kind of tell in a lot of these accounts because they talk about it more as a sweet myrrh. Um, the other traditional myrrh is very kind of dry and austere and is generally considered more of a Saturn thing. Um, and the moon is, is, is more um, voluptuous and kind of sweet. So, but here's an example of something. This goes probably back before the third century. And they had all these different sorts of incenses for um, perfumes, for the, excuse me, planets. So what they would do is they would do rituals where they would frequently entreat the planet. Um, they would, you know, ask for favors from the planet. Um, I'll be talking about this a little bit. So there were actual spells and things involving these that were magical practices. Okay, next. So the Picatrix. So this is an incredibly, um, an incredibly important book of astrological magic. It actually, the Arabic version of the Picatrix, Picatrix uh, is the, uh, Gold the Wise, um, Gayet al-Hakim. It, it, who knows who wrote it, but apparently it was a compendium of lots of things. It was later translated into Spanish in the 11th century for the, uh, King Alfonso, who really wanted it because it was like considered this uh, mystical work that he wanted, and it was also translated into Latin. It became really one of the most uh, influential books on planets and planetary magic. All kinds of infamous and famous people had it. It appeared in all different kinds of libraries, and I'll talk about it a little bit. 
It had a ton of what they call suffumigations, which are essentially incense mixtures for the planets. These were accompanied by prayers, where you would pray and entreat and the planet for specific favors. For instance, the sun was kind of like a king, and so you would do specific work with the sun if you needed an influential person to be on your side in the olden days. Yes, if the king was on your side, a lot of things would go for you. Um, for instance, nowadays, it would probably be like if the Netflix executive was on your side, he's like the king, and things would go for you. Um, they also had talisman, which, which are actually images associated with planets. And um, these are very interesting. I'm not giving them because they, a lot of them do not smell good, and they have uh, ingredients that are hard to deal with. And they also have all kinds of like terrible things like leopard blood and brains from various animals because they were um, meant to be magical and maybe they smelled okay, but they um, did have some fragrance components because some of the uh, ingredients were very aromatic. Um, this was thought to be part of this ancient tradition from Haran, which I can't go into in detail. You can look it up. It's in Southern Turkey, but it's an ancient city that's persisted for thousands of years where they had um, astrological worship, various temples to different planets, and a lot of astrological traditions or thoughts come from there. For various weird reasons, they were not really bothered during the time of uh, Islamic empire, even though they weren't, um, they were very pagan, they were not Christian or Jewish or um, Muslim, they kind of let them do their thing and they were there for quite a while. So, okay, next. Um, taking us up to um, Renaissance. So this is a really important um, book. This is by Massilio Ficino. This is 15th century Florence. Um, the Medici um, were his patrons, and I believe his father was the physician to Cosimo. Um, and he became this great translator. He was paid to translate the works of Plato, but he also decided to translate a whole bunch of other astrological things. And he published this very influential book called Three Books on Life. Um, it, it contained a lot of astrology. It had like astrological talismans, like magic rings you could wear. He had a whole chapter called On Obtaining Life from the Heavens, where it's, uh, people describe this as passive astrology. He would create an environment reflected a lucky planet like for instance Jupiter um, the day of Jupiter's Thursday he would have people go into the Jupiter room and they would have Jupiter colors and then eat Jupiter foods sometimes they would have musicians play music he had this whole astrological music thing it's obviously something you'd have to be super rich to do but it was kind of fascinating he felt like if you were in proximity to things that were associated with a happy planet that it would pick your mood up he did a ton of stuff with the sun too as well. And um, there's some thought that a lot of the frescoes and astrological um, things that you find like in Florence were actually there not just to be pretty, but they were supposed to actually make the room give people an astrological benefit. So it's interesting. Next. Okay, so Agrippa is incredibly important because people steal stuff from him. So. Agrippa wrote in the 16th century, you can see it here, it's called Occult Philosophy, um, and this is uh, when it was translated from the Latin. He gave this extensive list of planetary perfumes, um, which I'll discuss in a minute, um, which people stole and borrowed later on, and he also had a lot of stuff about using them to call up planets and angels and spirits associated with them to do magical works. Venus is the planet of love. You might be calling up Venus to do some sort of love spell, for instance. What's important, and I'll talk about this, is that the plants don't neatly fit into one planet, so everything in the material world is mixed, and so you will sometimes get certain fragrances that will uh, end up in different planets, which I'll talk to you about. Like, for instance, a lot of the animal fragrances, like musk, just end up being in all the all the planets, you know, Musk is good for the sun, it's good for Venus, it's good for Jupiter, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But we'll go on and I'll get into more details with this. But Agrippa was super important. So next. So this is one of the really, really important books that got reprinted because it was in relatively important and something that people in later on in the 19th century could read. So Francis Barrett was in this fashionable neighborhood of London. Um, and he wrote this book called The Magus, 
And he had kind of a salon there. He had very influential people, including writers and artists and so on, who, took, who studied with him. Um, and you can see the book up there. It has the Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. It has these angels at the top. Like you see Monday, it's the angel Gabriel. Then there's like a little sigil that represents uh, Gabriel. And it shows the moon, which is for Monday. Um, and so on. And he gave um, examples. Now, he also still has the old school ones. So Venus has musk, ambergris, aloes, and red roses, which is good. Then it has, you know, a mineral thing, red coral. And then, of course, you have to add the sparrow brain and the pigeon blood, which we probably wouldn't do nowadays. But this is traditional in that these were supposed to have this potency of Venus and, um, you know, add to the potency of something if you were fuming up a talisman or something this would be a venus um incense you would use okay next ah okay so now this is probably something people are familiar with so <clears throat> alistair crowley if people don't know who alistair crowley is um he is like the superstar magician occultist of the 20th century he was infamous for being bad and infamous he was in all the tabloid papers in the 20s he was called the wickedest man in the world um, he was born in the late 1800s in London from a wealthy family that he hated, and um, he had a very excellent education. He went to Cambridge. He became very involved in the cult. He belonged to this very influential late 1800s group called the Golden Dawn that was in England, um, and it was uh, other important people were William Butler Yeats and a lot of other sort of luminary people were involved in this Golden Dawn. That it was basically this occult group uh, uh, that was resurrecting magical practices. Um, and he was in this group, and he more or less stole <laughs> their papers and published them uh, as 777. So the Golden Dawn had specific lessons, but you, you, you were only allowed to look at them. You couldn't copy them or anything, but he apparently memorized them. And then he published this a whole bunch of them uh, as a book called 777 in 1909. He published things, they would have had a very limited distribution, they're mostly for his students. But what's important is that they have this incredibly extensive perfume and incense attributions where he has these tables where the perfumes match specific planets, specific gods, and so on and so forth. And um, the thing that makes it fascinating to me is I can tell from reading his commentary that he actually really did use these things. He had his own personal chemist, his own personal pharmacist in the West End at this fancy pharmacy who constantly gave him, well, he constantly gave him drugs too because he wrote this book called Diary of a Drug Fiend. So he gave him like psilocybin and, you know, uh, opium and things like that. But he also gave him all kinds of perfume materials which he experimented with. And when you read his work, it's clear that he's actually done work with incenses and various essential oils. So he had, this is a little trivia. He had his only, his own bad Bawe perfume, which was called Ruthfa. And what it was, it was a ambergris, musk, and civet. It was mostly civet. It was kind of a paste. And he thought that it was like a sex attractant that he would wear, though he said that a lot of times horses were attracted to him while he was walking around. But anyway, so that's his secret formula. You can look it up. I told it to you today. So, <laughs> He had this book that was um, organized in tables. It's very interesting because it really goes in depth in perfumes. Um, and I'll read you like a little tiny bit from a, just an example. It was not really a bit, he died like in the late forties. It was never reprinted. They did a tiny fine edition like in the fifties in London, but it really didn't come out until the psychedelic times of the seventies where it became available to people and then people stole it. I use the term source amnesia it is a term that I learned a couple years ago. It's like a nice word for when people may, <laughs> maybe they're not really plagiarizing because they just don't remember that someone gave it to someone else that gave it to them. But basically, a huge amount of astrology stuff you'll see from now is basically from this book, 777. It is a digital thing. If you want to look it up, just type in 777 Crowley. It's been digitized and you can find it. So the next page has a little quote, which I apologize is a little hard to read. Um, so he basically says, at one time or another, medieval writers have attributed every possible incense to every possible planet. It's true. There's not necessarily a lot of consensus. Um, but he says, um, you know, it's impossible for any two people to come about with a consensus here. But then later, of course, he says the attributions that I have are actually quite reliable. 
But following that, he says something kind of fascinating. He basically says, if you're serious about this, that you need to do it yourself. It says it's, he says it's incumbent upon the student to undertake experimental investigations in every case. He wants you to do practice with the material and really make up your own mind, which I think is fascinating because he says it's extremely important and that it's like this sort of link that's, that's key when you're doing works of magic. So he gets a star for telling people to do work and actually clearly he did a lot of stuff on his own. Um, if you want to know more about him, also, there's this CBS series called Strange Angel, which focuses on his students in Los Angeles in the 1930s and 40s. Um, it's not the best thing, but it's, it's, it kind of goes into a little detail about uh, Crowley in Los Angeles. So, okay, next. Um, oh, I'm sorry, this is kind of not so great. So, this table is supposed to be giving stuff. It's a little blurry. So tobacco is Mars. Olibanum is um, frankincense, that's sun. Benzoin is uh, Venus, et cetera, et cetera. Jasmine is the moon. Um, okay, we'll be doing the next one. I'm sorry, that one is not very crisp. You can look it up, it's online. So, and then just a shout out to like scholarly work. So the Warburg Institute is in London. Um, the Warburgs were a banking family in Germany, and one of the brothers became an art historian, and the, he basically had this crazy library. He was obsessed with um, iconography of um, classical themes, and he became very obsessed with astrology. Uh, he discussed the, what I'm going to call, uh, discussed the children of the planets. There's this motif from like frescoes and engravings like in the 14th and 15th century where they show a planet and then they show people going about occupations and activities associated with the planet. Um, and um, this, the Warburg still um, exists. It's considered the weirdest library in the world. It has all kinds of strange astrology and stuff. This particular book, Saturn and Melancholy, is this amazing, um, uh, just you know, amazing resource on the planet Saturn and images and stuff like that. And they translated the Picatrix, um, the Latin Picatrix and a lot of other astrological material. Um, th so the last thing was 777 and it was Crowley. It will just pop up if you do like a Google. Okay, next. Okay, so we're about to go into this now. You know what, are there questions I should ask because we're like halfway through? <laughs> or should I just plow through and do them at the end? What do people want? If you guys have questions, it's a good moment to pop them in the chat. Um, let me look at the chat. I'm sorry, I can't read it while I'm talking, so let me just pop it open. Oh, wow, there's a lot of stuff. Okay. So people are talking about uh, Black Earth. Jasmine. Moon Mountain. Uh, what would we look up for the last slide? Oh, 777, that's Crowley. Just type it in, It's digi there's a digital edition of that. Okay, well maybe we'll try to just get power on then a little bit, because I'm. this is really <laughs> so much. Okay, Fascinating. so Fascinating. I talked about the, so we're gonna jump right into the sun. So as I talked about, um, uh, the sun and the moon are the two luminaries. They are, you know, super important and, um, the sun is like a king. So here's some of the associations, which based on the stuff where I talked to you about using the sensory linking and the other associations, people who are involved in fragrance will have a little bit easier time with this. Think about like what would fragrances be that are associated with the day or with the color gold. And I'll give you an example in a minute. So gold is a color that's associated with the sun, also kind of oranges and yellows. Precious stone is ruby. It just happens to be ruby. Um, though also there's some other traditions that use um, some other stones that are kind of in the gold range. Um, kings and palaces. So, I mean, for me, if someone told me, if they gave me a perfume brief and they said, a perfume brief being kind of like a mission statement for perfume, and they said, I want you to make a palace. You know, I think that would kind of give me something interesting to start with. There are certain kinds of perfumes that seem very palatial and ornate and kind of overdone. Theaters are also associated with the sun because the sun is in the spotlight, is associated with being like a scintillating performance, you're in the spotlight. Um, uh, it's hot and dry according to traditional things. 
Frankincense is one of the things, and if you've ever seen pictures of frankincense, it grows like this scary little dead twig in the hottest, hottest desert where it's really hot and dry, and that's why they think it has the virtues of the sun, because it basically just soaks in that midday sun. Now, this is me. This is kind of an interpretation based on the way they translate things. So the sun was also described as being radiant, or they use this word aromatic that it doesn't really translate to English. My experience is the sun throws out powerful rays, and it's associated with a fragrance, which is powerful. The word to throw is like a technical perfume term, which I think is mostly used with candles. We'll see if Saskia, you know, nods. It means that it just really radiates um, fragrance from like, you know, a long ways away. And things that radiate strongly would be associated with the sun, um, just based on its kind of basic, you know, quality. Oranges are round and orange. And if you look at the picture of the sun, it looks like a big orange in the sky. So it's no surprise that oranges and lemons um, and tangerines and things like that were associated with the sun because they looked like the sun. I did a spices talk a while ago. Spices are, you know, things that are expensive for kings. They're hot and dry. Um, they're worth a lot of money. They were associated with the sun. All the incense resins, pretty much. Frankincense is the kind of er resin, the main one. Saffron makes things gold, literally, you know, and it also has a sort of a soft fragrance. It traditionally was used for the sun. And it's also really expensive, so you kind of have to be rich to have it, right? Um, the animal scents show up in different placements, but because musks and ambergris and stuff like that were, they, they were thought to be almost like signifying that you were a powerful animal in the room, that you were marking the room like, I am the lord of this room. I am marking you with my animal fragrance. So some of the animal fragrances do represent this kind of like, dominating authority. Um, so the next thing, um, Apollo, who is the sun, this is purely a mythological association. Apollo is shown with the bay laurel, where people have laurel uh, leaves on their head when they've won something, it shows victory. And so actually the actual bay laurel, which isn't used a ton, it's used in some fragrances, but it is associated with the sun. Um, any flower that's orange, um, would be solar. So Tagetes is like a Mexican marigold. We call it Mexican marigold. It's the one they have for Day of the Dead, which people do use in fragrances to a limited degree. Things that are sunny, like sunflowers, which don't have much fragrance, though there is apparently an essential oil of sunflower. Um, chamomile is solar because it's a little yellow round thing and it kind of looks like the sun. So, okay, let's do the next one. Oh, okay, so here's an example. I picked this just because I happen to have it, some in my house, and I was trying to come up with something that seems solar. So this is a cologne. Um, it's by the house perfumer from Hermes, Jean-Claude um, Elena, and um, it is called Eau de Neroli Doré. Now, Neroli is an orange flower. It's usually the essential oil of the orange flower. Doré means golden. So. It literally, the name is, is signifying that it's solar. It says it's gold, okay? And neroli is part of the orange family, and oranges are not exclusively sun, but they frequently are. The main notes in this are bitter orange, and then neroli is the flower of the bitter orange tree, and then saffron. These are generally considered kind of solar. Um, it used to be grown in the south of France in Grasse, um, apparently not anymore because the real estate's too expensive. Um, but it's associated with these luxury villas and being in the sun. And according to Jean-Claude, he said when he was young, he grew up in grass and he worked in a central oil factory and distilled the flowers of the orange flowers. And so he has this whole association with this. The packaging, of course, is orange, mostly because that's the color that Hermes uses um, as their sort of branding. But it's an interesting coincidence. So this is an example that I think of something that's primarily a solar thing. OK, next. Okay, so the moon we already talked with, it just in the, because I have so much to go, we'll zip over it, but remember it, it's kind of not watery night. I do mention it's domestic people, like the sun is kind of royalty and the moon is more common people, um, which does signify some sorts of changes in the fragrances too. Okay, next. So Mars, so we're going by the days of the week. Do not ask me about the 
order of it, it's complicated, but let's just get into it. So Tuesday is Mars. Mars literally looks red, if you look at it, kind of a dull red through a telescope. Is the angry red planet, it is considered malefic, which means it's kind of mean, all right? And um, not necessarily bad, but it's, it's an angry planet and it's very martial, it's very warlike. So the colors associated with it are reds and dark colors. It is considered hot, very hot. Um, and this scene, unfortunately, it's cut off. This is the children of the planets. There's like Mars flying up a bit above. You can see Scorpio up there. You can't see, uh, I'm not Scorpio. Yeah, you can see Scorpio right there, I think, yeah. Um, you can't see Aries, sorry. And there's all these pictures of people doing Mars things, which is basically killing and stabbing and stuff. Um, so it's associated with weapons. It's associated with destruction, things that are torn apart with machines and athletes. I know this normally wouldn't translate into a fragrance for you, but in fact, there are fragrances that are associated with machines. Like for instance, Santa Maria Novella has this uh, particular fragrance called Nostalgia, which smells like an old car. So there are people who, and there are some more avant-garde sorts of things like Comme de Garçon that has things that smell like uh, machinery or motor oil and things like that. Athletes, again, this is just sort of a thematic thing. Um, literally in ancient Rome, they used to scrape the sweat off of gladiators to use as sort of this magical fragrance. <laughs> um, so that's a thing. Um, it's, it's, it's associated with places that are fire is used where for instance, people are doing metal work. Also distilleries where they make fire water, which is liquor. So liquor is associated somewhat with Mars. The spices are classic. Peppers are like the very classic things associated with Mars. Carnation is a spicy, often red flower. It definitely has a clove fragrance. And there are some other spicy things like ginger. Tobacco is, a tradi is just traditionally associated with Mars. Um, it's considered like a stimulant. Basil, um, because it's traditional and also because it has oftentimes this clovey kind of smell. So anything that's burnt is ruled by Mars. And in perfumes and fragrances, we do have smoky notes. There's a thing called destructive distillations. This is kind of like in, if you think about liquid smoke, which is a flavor, they basically burn stuff and create a fragrance from it. One of the notable ones is Cade, which is a type of juniper smoke, but there's pine tar, which is very, very familiar, and birch tar, which is used to make uh, Russian leather. So stimulants also show up as Mars. Coffee is one that's a fragrance note, but a stimulant. Yerba mate is a newer, you know, colonial plant for us, um, and also a fragrance note, which tends to signify, <laughs> excuse me, as Mars. Okay, next. Okay, so Mercury is Wednesday. So we went through the ages of things, and um, Mercury is prepubescent, according to this. It rules children before puberty. It also shows up as sort of not with a gender because it's before people have sexual sec secondary um, uh, you know, characteristics. And so mercurial things are often not really gendered um, or they have mixed genders. Um, it's also associated with the crossroads and trickster gods, um, Hermes that was a thief and also a trickster. And I associate with fragrances that are very surprising. They start off with one thing and they turn into another. Um, it's associated with opals, and I do think there are fragrances that have an opalescent quality where they just seem to shimmer between one color or scent to another and switch back again. Uh, uh, gaming, scholars, speech, sciences, and medicine, these are sorts of areas of expertise, and this is sort of something that I could go into to great depths about how certain fragrances are associated with certain types of activities, but we'll kind of move on. I tend to associate it with things that are volatile and fast moving because if you see pictures of Mercury, he has those little tiny winged sandals and he flies all around. So he's very volatile. He's what we would call a top note in perfumery, something like, I think I meant, mentioned lavender, something like a lavender or something that you smell for a minute and then it flies off and it's gone. Um, there are traditional pictures of activities of mercury, which involve people cutting grasses in fields. And so it has been associated with grassy smells. I, I gave you one down there. It's a aroma compound called cis-3-hexanol, which is something that people use. It smells like cut grass. There's also, I believe, a natural isolate you can get. Um, and things 
that are hay-like, the word agrestic, sorry, I used that. That's like totally a perfume thing that means it smells kind of like hay or, or kind of like, you know, dried grasses and stuff like that. Um, herby things, partly I think because it's medicinal, so things like lavender and mints, things that are medicinal, um, eucalyptus, which is a, a newer plant, people nowadays consider kind of mercurial. I don't know why nuts, and I didn't write down seeds, but nuts and seeds are traditionally mercury too. Okay, next. Okay, so Jupiter is considered the greater benefic. He's one of the luckiest planets associated with money. Um, it's where we get the word jovial or jolly. Um, and he's considered to be very expansive. He makes things grow, basically. It's warm and moist, which makes me think that, you know, you plant something in the soil, it's fertile, things grow, grow, grow. Um, as far as flavors, he tends to go towards the sweet things. Um, he is associated sometimes with <laughs> feasting, kind of like overdoing it. And so I associate it with fragrances that are like very over the top. They have like a lot going on. Um, rich older men who are very affluent um, would be very Jupiterian. And I think we can all identify certain sorts of fragrances, which kind of code is like rich old banker sitting in, you know, a club chair or something. He's associated with priests and, and uh, judges, courthouses, um, higher education like colleges, orchards because they're very fertile and it, there's this whole thing with fruit. Um, I, I said costly fabrics. I think there's fragrances that we can kind of read as like, you know, brocade and things like that. Um, and traditionally fruits, especially fruits with a lot of seeds, Older tradition, cedar, just because cedar was used in the worship of um, older gods like uh, that were associated with the planet Jupiter. The oak tree associated with Zeus and Jupiter, so was a, an oak moss by its sort of association. And then other trees like figs, olives kind of cross several different planets, but they are sometimes given for Jupiter. Um, and then kind of um, uh, expensive, sorts of fancy spices like nutmegs and cloves, which were essentially for rich people, and oud or loveswood, as if you have ever experienced it, you know it's very trendy, but the real stuff is super expensive. Okay, next. Okay, so Venus. So Venus is important. If you remember anything, Venus rolls perfume, so we should all remember this. Um, there, I didn't include it, but there's this incredible statue in the Vatican that shows um, Venus coming out of the ocean. If you've ever seen these uh, paintings of Venus on the half shell, she rose from the sea at the island of Cyprus. Um, and there's a, a statue in the Vatican where she's completely naked, but she's carrying an alabaster perfume jar of perfumed unguent. So she, she literally, her magical weapon was like perfume and she was associated with perfume and a sense of smell and this is all written up in like stuff from like the second century uh, astrologers like Vedius Valent and so um she is important to think about when you think about perfumes she rules all flowers according to this uh tradition um I mean flowers technically could be considered the sex organ of the plant but they're also very delicate and beautiful and they display like the beauty of the plant so I say here, her children are engaged in venery. Venery is the same root as venereal disease. Basically, it means like debauchery and sex. Also, you can see down there, people are feasting in the lower corner, um, kind of like partying. Music, there are people playing lyres. Um, she's associated with music. But there's not a picture of bathing, but frequently, oh, there's some nude people maybe in the back in that little stream, I can't tell. So bathing was associated with her, anything artistic, dancing, as I said, um, gardens. Places of that are sexy, like beds and boudoirs, were ruled by her. Um, places of amusement, fountains. She's very keyed towards towards water. So there's like a million sorts of things that we can see as Venus scents. I think we all can think of boudoir scents and and floral scents and things that we call gourmand. They're associated with um, you know fine food and desserts. She has this quality of pulling things together, which is like, a, she's sort of the love goddess. So she brings people together in a, and this is abstract, but some fragrances, I think you can associate this where the, some of them fly apart into a lot of directions, which is more Mars. And this where things kind of conjoin. Um, her colors, her metal is copper. Her colors, if you've ever seen copper that is exposed to the elements, it becomes um, this verdigris. 
um, and also copper minerals are green and uh, blue, like um, you know various forms of azurite and malachite. It's also associated with paler colors like pink and things like that. So these, if these code to fragrances for you, this is very Venusian. All foods that are aphrodisiacs belong to her. Uh, modern astrologers will add stuff like chocolate because it's something you would give someone you're in love with or you wanted to influence in a love situation. Um, traditionally, bees and honey, um, roses belong to Aphrodite. This is very classic. Ambery scents, warm things. Sugary scents, vanilla. Balsams are things like benzoin that are um, classically used. So just a sort of a little aside. I... <laughs> There's a lot of crossover here. For instance, roses is all roses are always associated with Venus, but there's lots of subsystems. For instance, white roses might be associated with the moon, and some other roses might be associated with Jupiter, and so on and so forth. Um, okay, so what are we doing for time? Okay, so let me speed up next. Okay, so Saturn, uh, obviously my favorite planet because he's kind of the goth planet. Um, so Saturn is the farthest out. So the he represents the boundaries and also sort of people who transgress boundaries like hermits and people who live in isolated places. Um, Malefic, he was considered bad luck for normal people. He was more a planet of like her, a planet that ruled over hermits and scholars and stuff like that. His color is dark. It's usually black or very dark colors. He rules over places that are ruined. As an example of this, I mentioned dark forests. So scents that are very dark, like you know, heavy forest scents like pines could be considered Saturn. Things that are code to graveyards because cypress trees were planted in graveyards, they're associated with Saturn. Mines, things that are underground or things where you dig up the dirt or plow are very um, much Saturn. Things that grow underground. So vetiver is, um, is used in fine fragrance and it does grow underground. It has a very rooty kind of smell. So that's Saturn. Dirt scents. This is again kind of me interpreting this as a Saturn thing. There are a number of things that smell like dirt. Um, petrichor is this thing that they described as the scent of dirt after the rain's been on it because uh, various microorganisms produce this beautiful fragrance. Geosmin is a synthetic which is also found in moist soil. It has a very much of a cool moist dirt smell. Miti atar is sandalwood that's distilled through clay. It's a classic Indian atar. It smells incredible. It smells like dirt and, uh, and also like sandalwood. Patchouli, people give patchouli under different planets. I see patchouli since it, people always describe it as kind of musty or it smells like a tomb or moldy or whatever. To me, I actually really like it, but it is kind of on the cold and Saturn kind of uh, goth scale. Saturn rules over stinky things like goats. I know that there are natural perfumers who use goat uh, hair and perfume, so that is a real thing. Um, leather, if you know about leather making, they used to cure fresh hides in aged urine. It was incredibly nasty and horrible, and that's why we developed this whole scent of, uh, whole thing of scenting leather uh, because it was kind of nasty, but leather does get considered as a Saturn thing. Um, even as a perfume. Things that are sweaty, um, cumin is used in curry and other things. It's sometimes used in fragrances in small amounts. It's very interesting, but it does give kind of a sweaty effect. Uh, so beavers, if you're not a perfume person, you may not know that they have a scent gland and that this has been used for centuries in perfumes. It's um, usually often as a tincture or an absolute and it smells, um, Gosh, it smells kind of leathery and it also has the smell kind of like a single malt scotch. It's kind of a bit medicinal. It's interesting, but it's used in a lot of leather uh, fragrances. Um, and anything that's cold, dry, and old, um, the, the classic myrrh, I think, actually fits pretty well. Here's a Saturn thing. So, okay, let me look at the time. Okay, next. Um, this is just, I didn't go into Indian stuff as much, but this is an example of India. This is a representation of Shani, who's the planet Saturn. There's still actually temples to Saturn there. Mostly people go and do mantras and prayers to ask Saturn not to kick their butt, like during their um, Saturn planetary transits and stuff like that. Um, but there's a lot of stuff where they give him incense and other kinds of offerings. And this has been a, you know, a living tradition. So next. 
Okay, so I wanted to do a quick sum up here. So I'm gonna use animals. On the left, we have a perfume by zoologists. So I do believe um, that zoologist has been nominated for several of the Art and Faction Awards this year as a finalist. It's a really interesting, um, they have a really interesting concept where they pick different animals and make a fragrance based on them, which I think is brilliant and really works well with this whole idea of like, how would you make a fragrance that fits in with the planet? Here I've listed animals that are traditional for different planets. Um, at the top we have the sun. The sun is like the king and animals that are considered very alpha and dominant. Um, lions, of course, the Leo, the lion is the sun sign um, or the sun. Eagles are like also kind of imperial. Roosters, I think partly because they also greet the rising sun. Um, thoroughbreds like Arabian horses, fine fancy horses that are owned by super rich people. These have been associated with the sun. I think if you were to make a fragrance based on a thoroughbred horse, it could be you know, very much of a solar thing. I mentioned already the moon is, is like uh, aquatic animals and nocturnal animals. Mercury are, is, is a trickster and it's smart. So you get things like parrots that talk, you get monkeys that are very trickstery. You get um, also a very intelligent animals like fox that has this whole Reynard the Fox uh, story cycle about being a little trickster. Venus has animals that are considered lustful and also kind of beautiful. A lot of birds like doves and sparrows. Mars has killer animals, venomous things, leopards, um, birds of prey. Jupiter has large, big animals, traditionally things like bulls and elephants. And so Saturn, I'm just going to talk about for a minute. So beaver is actually associated with Saturn. I don't know why. Part of it is that it's a dark animal. Um, but traditionally, the beaver gland has been listed as an astrological thing for Saturn. Um, also, slow animals and things that are kind of mysterious and sneaky who live underground, like snakes. Um, and not to go into too many details, but this is an example where they made a whole fragrance based on beaver, which does in fact apparently have either synthetic or real castor am, I don't know what, and you know, they have a whole concept of just, you know, basing stuff on beaver. So, okay, next. Okay, so I'm gonna do like three minutes and then we'll have questions. So I don't have time to go into some stuff. So basically, um, starting in the 20s and 30s, I mean, there were uh, fashionable kind of astrology people who were doing things. This is an example. It was reprinted in the 45, but it's from the 1930s. This is by an astrologer. This is when, um, you know, a lot of people came to LA to be astrologers. It was very fashionable amongst the entertainment industry. And they started linking them, you know, with perfumes. In the next page, I'll just show you an example. Like she gives... Um, uh, Sunday is ruled by the sun. It's heliotrope, which turns towards the sun. Heliotrope is kind of a beautiful powdery smell. Orange blossom, she lists. Um, she gives mastic as an incense and the colors orange. Monday, she lists as white rose or wallflowers um, and the incense is myrtle. Um, so I don't, I'm going to stop here because I'm never, I don't want to go into more. I've kind of rushed through this. I apologize because it's really a long talk. Um, so probably we should open this up to questions for people because I don't want to go too much longer. Is that okay, Saskia? Do you want to go back Absolutely. on, Absolutely. No, yeah, no, cool. Uh, somebody was asking to okay. see the slide um, from the moon smells again. So I'm just going to quickly go back through and I apologize for this, everybody. Um, so yes, go back to the moon slide. smells. I think that was like slide three. I, I did the moon spells. Um, um, to be honest, I tried to do one planet where I went into a little bit more detail because I couldn't yeah. possibly do it. Um, it's very close to the beginning. Okay, um, here we go. I think we're getting there. It was like right here. Here we go. There it is. Okay. So yeah, this one is kind of an example where I wanted to dive a little deeper. And if I had an extra hour, I would probably do this with the other ones. This is more the way that I work with things with symbol systems. And like I said, like in talking about that class, if you link various senses, um, you know, what is a perfume that's cool? What's something that's moist? Um, you know, what, like the lactonic thing, how do you associate something with milk? Or, you know, what does it mean if a, a scent is pale or if it's kind of luminous to you like a pearl? Okay. Okay. So here we are. Um, okay. 
Any questions, you guys? That was kind of a lot. It was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>